All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 4th, 2024. Oh, it's May the 4th day for all those Star Wars enthusiasts out there. And you know what? It's an exciting time for us as well here in the ministry. After all of these revelations, after all of this tracking and, and, and opening of scriptures that have been happen, happening prophetically over the last about six and a half or so years, we are down to what we believe are the final hundred days from today to August 12th. You know, give or take a day, depending on what side of the world you live on. It's exciting. And I want to preface this by saying, if 2024 is the year. Now, do I absolutely know this is the year? No. Do I believe it is with the most certainty I've ever had? Yes, because of the revelation. Understanding 70 years. Understanding who is in the land, that it's the house of Judah, not the house of Israel. Understanding that that it's a session or non a session is dependent on that count. That when they came into the land, Leviticus 19 explains to us how to count when they came into the land and we know how to do it. That makes this year the final year that I can understand biblically how we can get a 70 years from when they came into the land. So it's extremely exciting. It, it's even hard to sometimes fathom. But there's one thing I am certain of. And that is that no matter the year when it will happen, it will be the 8th of Av. We've revealed, we've understood, we've broken down in many, many teachings how it ends up that the true feast of weeks of the seven Sabbaths brings us to the 8th of Av every single year, which in 2024 is August 12th. Now, maybe the 13th and the evening of the 13th for some, maybe late on the 11th for others. But it will officially be that time right to the end of the 8th of Av. That will be the end of the 7th Sabbath. This is that period in here of the escape, the pre-trib bride of Christ, regardless of what year it will happen, though we believe this is the year. I want everybody to hear this, though we believe the revelation has revealed that 2024 will be the year. You know, I had a great conversation yesterday with our brother Olu. He had some questions as he was driving home with his wife and we went into a bunch of things and he was asking about, you know, why did it have to be connected to 40 days of the son of man? who is the white horse rider, why did it have to be connected to his birth? And what was this about two months and all of these things? Man, it was such an exciting, I mean, I wish, it's one of those things again, I wish I had recorded the phone call and I would have just posted that for you guys. It was just so incredible to track and to see and to connect and to understand how the Jubilee connects and all of these things, realizing that all of it ends and at the end of 14 years is the final Jubilee and we can track all that all the way back to the birth of Christ, when he declared it in Luke 4, the year time frame that he did it in. There's all of these things on top of 70 years and how to understand 70 years when they came into the land with Leviticus and, and to know whether it's a session or non a session because it's the house of Judah in the land, not the house of Israel in the land right now. All of these things are what pointed us in scripture to 2024 but one thing i do know that i am as confident about as i am in all of the revelation of the gospels and of the tribulation years being 14 years i know that it's connected to the eighth of av for the pre-trib now before i really get started some of you that might be new and you're hearing this you're saying this revelation of the gospels you're going to hear who the gospels are speaking to you're going to hear what 14 years of tribulation Yes, I promise you, don't turn this off because you're hearing 14 years. I promise you, you will understand that the truth is 14 years and a period of time called above. And in today's video, we are going to go, in today's teaching, we are going to go into this above portion. Now, we've spoken on this above portion many, many times in many different facets and aspects and, and parts and pieces and the whole of it. But today, because I've had a couple questions about, um, about the, the wars that come first, 
I thought this would be a great time to bring in a shareable video that won't be too long that people could share with others to let them know how this would begin to play out. And that's this 50 days, this above portion that's above the 14 years, which is 50 days. I'm going to explain how it broke down. I'm going to explain what happened, what revealed it, what confirmed it, what all through Scripture has revealed within this. And I believe that with 2024 being the year, this is where you're going to see attack one, and this is where you're going to see attack two. Both of those things starts the 50 days, and the other one ends at the end of the 50, uh, starts at the end of the 50 days. So one begins it, and one ends begins the 14 years so one starts the 50 days the other one begins the 14 years you'll see what i'm talking about you'll see why we can prove also that the 14 years of tribulation will begin at the feast of trumpets the day and hour no one knows all of this revealed from scripture but i'm going to do my best not to get too caught up in the weeds of going into other events that happen within the 50 days so if you're new to the channel, you can either go to ministryrevealed.com and from the menu box, click intro series and watch the first four videos. The other thing you could do is come to the playlist right here on YouTube and click revealed end time study note series. Watch the first four videos. The first video is this image right here. It's a 22 minute intro to the next three videos. It'll give you a little bit of a lay of the land of things that have been revealed. Then the second video is part one where it goes into a 30 minute Bible study. It's an introduction to the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to. If you've ever gone through the gospels and you've seen stories that you think are the same stories, yet, yet what it talks about, the words are different. The, the kind of events and, and things going on within it are different. Well, there's a reason for it. And most and, and it, it had never been revealed before. It started here almost oh, well, about six and a half years ago in September of 2017. That was the beginning of it. The 14 years and the above portion that we're going to get into started about late October of 2017. And I promise you, as you begin to see these differences in the Gospels be revealed to you, just in that thir first 30-minute Bible study, it it's going to blow your mind because if you've studied the Scriptures and have seen these, you will have most certainly have had questions throughout your, throughout your years of studying Scripture. But pastors in the church have always just told us that it's just perspective. Well, it's not just perspective, and we can prove it we can prove that some of the events discussed haven't actually taken place because there was no way he could have done both at the same time. So that's what these things will get in and reveal. And what does it all mean? What, is, what do these differences mean? It's all prophecy. The entirety of the differences in the Gospels is all prophetic insight. It is all about what is to come. And what you're going to see is the gospel of matthew the gospel of mark and the gospel of luke the synoptic gospels the first will be last the last will be first so matthew mark luke in the end of days goes luke mark matthew and you know what it reveals pre mid and post pre mid and post all being true the pre-trib happens before the first attack that we're going to talk about tonight it happens right before the first attack. The pre-trib happens right at the time when those 50 days are about to begin. That's when the pre-trib will happen. That begins everything. There's no big war. There's no bomb drop. There's no things falling from the sky immediately. It will all begin with the world being caught off guard, except those who are watching, praying, repentant, loving, diligent in the Lord. Those are the ones who will vanish and the world will be left frazzled, they'll be left unawares and in chaos, and bang, that's when the first attack comes. And we'll break down that first attack, and then the one that will follow. In the, in the second, really the third video, but in the second of the series, is about the 14 years. The 14 years in the portion that's called above. And when you see this, you will begin to understand why there's differences again in the Gospels, and how these differences 
reveal the differences in the timing being pre, mid, and post, but also these differences within the discourses will now be understood. They will now make sense to you. And you will see pre, mid, and post within them because they're right there. Luke talks about escaping all of these things that shall come to pass. That's pre-trip. Mark talks about the Lord coming in the clouds, and then it will be on a day and hour no one knows. That's not actually pre-trip. That's the Lord coming at about mid-tribulation, which is at the start of the seventh year of seals. And then the great multitude rapture will happen in the seventh year. You go to Matthew's gospel, and in Matthew's discourse, you see the day and hour no one knows, and it talks about the story of Noah. Well, in that final year, when in, in Matthew, the day and hour no one knows, that's the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, when the whole world will see him from one end to the other as lightning. The one at the end of, at the end of six year of seals, that's when he's coming in the clouds with Mount Zion, the place prepared. It sounds crazy. It's a lot to take in. But I promise you, if you start with this intro series, it will make sense. But the fourth video, the third in the series, is the one called It's All Because of Matthew. And the reason that is so powerful and so important, it's a longer video, but it will pass by quickly if you study it along the way. Because you're going to see the reason Mark and Luke had never been understood before is because we all have been taught all of the seminaries, everything focused on the Gospel of Matthew not understanding who Mark was speaking to or who Luke was speaking to. So everybody has been taught foundationally from the Gospel of Matthew, so everything they see is seven. They see seven years of tribulation, and they call it Jacob's trouble. They call it for the Jews. Well, they've missed that there's seven years for the church that wasn't prepared. There's the pre-trib bride going first and the sleeping left-behind church world that's going to go through seals. It's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, and then Luke's portion is the, the portion of the above. I promise you it'll be worth all your time. Just watch the first four videos. Study them out, pray over them, seek them, and I promise you it will all start to make more sense. You'll see the scriptures open up like crazy. So, like I said, tonight we're going to focus on this portion called above and this portion called above begins at the ninth of av so from the ninth of av to the 29th of elul is exactly 50 days now not only was this 50 days important but what also what, what also was important was the day and hour that no one knows the reason for this importance you will see as we kind of wrap it up at the end why it's important because you're going to see the day and hour that no one knows being spoken about in mark being spoken about in matthew is all about the feast of trumpets but it's not the beginning of tribulation it's the end of the six years to the start of the seventh year of seals and then it's the end of the sixth year to the start of the seventh year of trumpets, which is the end of the 13 years of tribulation. And it's all related to the day and hour no one knows. We were able to take this and then follow why Matthew's gospel talks about the days of Noah in his discourse after the return of the Lord. And we know the time of Noah is one year and 10 days. And the only time that you have one year and 10 days is at the end of seven times seven years for a jubilee. So when you go when you go read in um, Leviticus 25 about a jubilee count, we know it's seven times seven years. That 49th year is the only year where it's one year and then 10 more days to sound the shofar of the jubilee on the Day of Atonement. Well, that was also another clue as to why Matthew's gospel in his discourse only has the days of Noah being spoken about there because that is the 14th year of tribulation. It will be one year and 10 days and it will end the 14 years of tribulation from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets and then there's 10 more days to atonement 
where they sound the shofar for the jubilee at the end of 14 years. Now, you see, right off the bat, I already got a little bit sidetracked. <laughs> it's still part of the understanding to know and to understand why realizing and understanding and revealing that the tribulation begins at the Feast of Trumpets and the 14 years of the tribulation will end at the Feast of Trumpets is very, very important. And the scriptures have absolutely revealed it. Now, the biggest mystery that took a long time to understand was this portion called above. Now, this all started in uh, October of 2017. I started with, with this, all of a sudden getting this revelation. I mean, my life, it was so crazy. For the first, uh, I always say about the first year, year and a half, it was so wild in my house because I started to understand things that had never been understood before, just mysteries hidden within Scripture, and and I was I was freaking out. I I was in tears some weeks. I mean, it was just it was so much to take in. But now to be able to see it and see how it's grown and the details over the years has been absolutely phenomenal. But what happened in October of 2017 was I came across Second Corinthians chapter 12, and you got to remember that. During the September portion, I started getting the revelation of the differences in the Gospels. And I realized it went Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And there was this pre-mid-post thing being revealed within it. And then I got this revelation of this, this typology of prophecy in what Paul fulfilled in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Where it says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So this man in Christ, which was above 14 years ago, which means it had to be less than 15 years, was one who was caught up to the third heaven. You guys know the word caught up means harpazo. Okay, it's the Greek word for rapture. But it said such an one. So it's like a rapture for this group that's taken. But this one goes to the third heaven. And if Paul's speaking about himself being in Christ, all of a sudden here he says, I knew such a man. So not in Christ like the first one, but, you know, believing in him, but just not fully in Christ like the first one. And it says that this one was raptured, was caught up, but this one went to paradise. And I thought, wait a second. Having understood the differences within the Gospels in the pre, mid, post, I saw Luke, I saw Mark, and then you keep reading, and it says in verse 14, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. This is where he's speaking to Judah. He's speaking now to the end of tribulation. And what did you see? The first one was a taking. The second one was a taking. And the third one was a return. Well, that's exactly what the Gospels were revealing in Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre-mid, and then his post-return feet down. But where the biggest mystery within this, and there, even though there were many, many, many mysteries along the way as you dig and more comes to be revealed, the biggest mystery in this, above, in this 14 years piece was the word above. The above was, was a big tongue twister for a while. Obviously, it had to be less than 15 years, or it would have said 15 years. So there's a period of time, less than a year, that's called above 14 years ago. And that's what we started, and I started to dig into more and more with everything else until we got some incredible, incredible, incredible clarity. Now, I want you to remember right off the bat that in Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says the thing that has been. So for those that hadn't heard this before, th from creation to Christ is the was. From Christ until the moment of the pre-trib is the is. And from the pre-trib to the end is the is to come. So what we read here in Ecclesiastes 1 is the thing that has been. Okay, the was. Is that which shall be is to come. And that which is done, which is the is we're still in, from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, is that which shall be done. So the was 
and the is are both going to reveal the is to come that there is nothing new under the sun and i've often showed this by showing from the ministry revealed book this this breakdown because we revealed the revelation of the seven churches of the end of days as well and what we find is there are typologies in the old testament to the seven churches and this is the breakdown well this old testament of the seven churches and typology played out over about 2500 years and then of course from christ and the apostles to the pre-trib we're playing out and we're in the laodicean age right now this is played out over about 2000 years but the is to come of the seven churches which plays out in typologies of was and is and this took 2500 and this took 2000 it's going to play out over the 14 years and above it's wild so when you read in mark's discourse and in matthew's discourse that it's going to be a time worse than it was since creation you could imagine what it means worse than anything else we've read from the old testament and the new testament and everything the enemy's done and all of the chaos the end of days in a portion of seals and in the portion of trumpets mark's and matthew's portion it's going to be worse than it ever was in human history that's hard to swallow that's that's hard to even fathom but i want you to realize 2500 years 2000 years is going to play out over 50 days and 14 years that's how intense the the end of days have revealed that's the intensity of what's coming that's pretty crazy so now if we understand that it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets and mark's portion is to seals and of uh, seven years of seals and matthew's portion is seven years of trumpets in relation to their discourses we needed to understand then what is this above and this took quite a while but what happened is in uh i think it was about april of 2018 i came across a brother that was speaking about the book of zechariah uh yeah the book of zechariah and the book of hosea and it dawned when i looked at it that both zechariah and hosea each had 14 chapters so out of all of the 66 books of the bible they were the only two that had 14 chapters each and I thought, oh my goodness, something is definitely going on here. We already understood things were going on with the book of Psalms, and it's been around, I think, since the late 80s, early 90s, that there was an understanding uh, that there were chapters that related to years in order, and you could find verses within it that pertain to events happening in those years. Well, I was able to reveal that within the end of days. And so it wasn't a surprise when I saw 14 chapters and 14 chapters and realized that the Hosea tells us in Romans that Hosea is wrote, written to the Gentiles and Zechariah is written to the Jews. I was like, oh my goodness. And of course, since then over the years, we've been able to reveal all of these events happening within them that reveal events going on to the end of days. And so, as this started to open up by in april of 2018 and i start reading through it and i see all these events i mean it was it was so exciting and i stuck on one piece in chapter 7 in zechariah chapter 7 check this out and i used to teach on this and we were trying to figure it out and break it down for a long time until we got it and so what you realized is that if it was 14 chapters and 14 chapters and you've got your seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets you need to understand it's not one trumpet one year one or one seal one year second seal next year you know that's not how it works the seals have their portions of time so the first seal we're going to talk about but then the second third and fourth are pretty much simultaneous but but some are activated more aggressively and some hold back so don't get confused in thinking just because there's seven seals that seven seals is one by year 
or seven trumpets is one per year. That's not how it works. But we are going to cover the first seal. This doesn't mean one seal, two seals, okay? These are years, okay? And so what, you came, what I came to find out is in Zechariah, I went to chapter 7. And I taught on this for a long time because it started to catch my attention. But I didn't know what these fastings and mornings were at first. Except, well, I knew what the first one was of the fifth month, but I didn't understand the one of the seventh month until a Messianic Jewish sister had told me what it was. And then it started to open up more. But in Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5, it said, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When? So what you're going to notice is everything in this is past tense, and I'm going to show you the reason. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those, past tense, 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even unto me? Verse 7, should you not hear the words which the Lord had cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south of the plain? Everything is speaking about a past tense, but that they did these things for those 70 years. Well, when you go back to chapter 1 and you go to chapter uh, verse 12, we see this incredible piece of scripture. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? Okay, he's not talking about the people. He's saying, Lord, how long will it be before you'll have mercy on the land that has your name on it? And on the cities of Judah, against which you have had indignation, these 70 years. So we have those 70 years. And then in chapter one, we have these 70 years. This is why I tell you the 70 years are something that was really important to try and figure out, to understand what scripture told us. And that's where we find ourselves right now from the Feast of Trumpets of last year to the Feast of Trumpets of this year. In the 70th year, we've got videos that explain how it is the 70th year, and it's from a biblical count with Leviticus. And as I said earlier, understanding accession and non-accession, realizing that it's Judah in the land right now, not the house of Israel. You see, which makes us in the 70th year right now. That was a big deal. So in relation to this above portion, we see that there's something going on where the Lord is bringing to our attention in chapter 7 where the past tense of those 70 years, meaning the Jews were doing something on the, in the fifth month and in the seventh month for 70 years since they've been in the land that it's been theirs according to Scripture. That's important. You know what that tells me? It tells me more than one thing. It tells me that the Hebrew calendar is correct. It tells me that they are working off of the calendar that the Lord is, is, is confirming. Because he's saying for 70 years, they fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month. For me, that was a confirmation that their calendar and the one they're using is correct. Of course, I went and confirmed these things with the sun, moon, and stars tracked out the constellations, and it's correct. Other people want to want to think it's this way or that way, and that's fine. But I believe I've been able to show that the Hebrew calendar is the one that is on track. So what is this count, and why was this so important? Well, if chapter 1 is, is connected to the, these 70 years and chapter 7 is those 70 years, well, then remember, it's like being in the seventh year of seals and it's going back to saying those 70 years. You see? So those 70 years, they did those things. And since then, they haven't. So since chapter one, they haven't been doing it. And what was this key thing? Do you know that there's the morning or, or a fasting that takes place in the fourth month and the 10th month? Yet the fourth month and the 10th month aren't mentioned. Only the fifth and the seventh. Well. When you realize that the fifth, which is an easy one to understand, is the ninth of Av, and then you come to the one and the seventh, which they observe here, 
on the third of Tishri, it all starts to make sense. It's the portion called above. However, why do they observe it over here on the third of Tishri? That, that kind of throws you for a little loop until you do some studying. So what I realized was that there was something that the Lord was telling us prophetically that was connected to something they did for 70 years on the fifth and seventh month, but didn't get to do after that. So it's clearly connected to the fifth and seventh month. So why is the seventh month even so important? Well, as I told you earlier, the day and hour no one knows. When you, when you realize that the day and hour no one knows being spoken of in Mark and being spoken of in Matthew is, is truly talking about the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, you realize, wait a second, if there's something that happens on the 5th and something that happens on the 7th, that takes us to the day and hour no one knows and the start of tribulation after something they had done for 70 years that they can no longer do again. And then it started to open up. So what is this one on the 5th month? Well, as you saw, the one on the 5th month, if I've been able to show that the end of the 8th of Av <coughs> is the end of the seven Sabbath count for the Feast of Weeks, because you have to understand the Feast of Weeks is when you put the sickle to the wheat. And the wheat is all about winter wheat. And the sickle gets put to it about the middle of Savan, which is the third Hebrew month, generally late May to early mid-June. And so this is where you end up on the 8th of Av every single year, no matter what. Well, if this is the pre-trib, and we know that the, that the scripture says there's an above portion, and we found prophetic scripture that talks about the fifth month and the seventh month, fasting and mourning. Look at the connection. Pre-trib escape, bang. Something happens. Something happens connected to the fifth month of their fasting and mourning, which is called the ninth of Av or Tishbiav. And if you go look up the history of Israel, everything has over the over the millenniums happened to Israel on the ninth of Av. Okay, from the ninth going into the tenth. That's why I say it's the eighth going into the ninth and so forth for the pre-trib, depending where you are on earth. So you find things like the spies returned from the promised land. Both of the temples were destroyed on the ninth of Av. The Barcoba revolt we've taught on over the years. The Barcoba revolt happened on the 9th of Av. Um, when they were banished, the Jews were uh, um, uh, expulsion from uh, England for the Jews. And in 1492, the banishment from, uh, of all Jews from Spain. All of these things and more have happened to the Jews on the 9th of Av. And here we have a piece of scripture telling us that there's something prophetically that is connected to something going on on the fifth and the seventh month. Now, they did this in mourning for 70 years, but for the last seven years, according to this, in the prophetic understanding, they weren't able to do it for the last seven years, but there was something still going on that was giving us this count. But we realized within this count that it was exactly 50 days. It's 50 days from the 9th of Av to the 29th of Elul. Or if you wanted to say, you know, because it went from the 9th into the 10th, then you would go from the last day of the year to the first day of the year of the Feast of Trumpets. It's exactly 50 days. Now, why was this so important? Well, as I explained, it's at the mid time of the month of Savan, the third Hebrew month, when the winter wheat is ready to harvest. 
which means they cannot put the sickle to the wheat to start cutting it down until the wheat is ready. And there is no such thing as wheat ready, as we've taught many times in March, April. It does not exist. When you understand that it starts at about the 16th of Savan, you know, that's the biblical timing, even though maybe it's a little bit sooner on, on you know, in, in the earth right now or a little bit later. It's always generally around the middle of Savan when winter wheat starts to get cut down. We know that scripture says seven Sabbaths. When you count the seven Sabbaths, which is the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th of every month, you end up at the seventh Sabbath at the 8th of Av. Well, when you understand scripture, that tells you in Leviticus that you shall number seven Sabbaths, and after seven Sabbaths, it says, shall you number 50 days? It doesn't say the 50th day like everything else said. It says, then shall you number 50 days. When you understand that, guess what? We got 50 days from the ninth of Av to the end of the year. You have precisely 50 days left. And what did we discover? Not only did we discover that late July into about mid August is when the end of the wheat harvest happened, and it was when loaves of bread baked with leaven were brought in, but it was also 50 days later, always about mid September, to earlyish October when the wine harvest came in and there was new wine. This was big deal stuff to understand because we've all been told that the seven Sabbaths are 50 days and they end around here in the third month of, of uh, Savan on the Hebrew calendar, which could be late May or early mid-June. And we've all been told that, that seven Sabbaths and then the 50th day. It's not true. There is no way you can harvest any wheat before that time. Because the seven Sabbaths of the Feast of Weeks is for the wheat harvest. Which makes it impossible to happen first. And then when you understand that there's 50 days that are counted after that. And you've got exactly 50 days in this count from the fasting of the morning of the 5th to the fasting in the morning of the 7th, oh man, does it start to open up. But again, what was the fasting in the morning of the 5th month, which is the 9th of Av? Historically, it's always been an attack in the land of Israel. Or more clearly, I should say an attack against the Jews. So it's either they were kicked out of land, they were attacked and destroyed, the two temples were destroyed. It's always been an attack against them that signified the beginning of something. Something new they had to flee. You follow? Both temples being attacked and destroyed, they had to flee. They, they lost. Out of England, out of Spain, they had to flee. This is the beginning of attacks. And I'm going to prove it to you. So we see that this is connected to an attack. And when we go to Jeremiah chapter 52, you see it here where the story is being recounted. And it says now in the fifth month on the 10th day of the month. So we know it went from the ninth, 10th day of the month, which was in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came ne uh, ne Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, which served the king, uh, which served the king of Babylon. So we see this destruction that takes place with, of course, Zedekiah there, who was the king, who was uh, the leader of Israel at the time in Judah. And we know that this was the time of the attack. So we know that historically, every thing had this connection in relation to big attacks and things that happened to Jews. Remember. It is Judah in the land is an event that takes place. And here we had scripture telling us the ninth, uh, uh, sorry, the fifth month and the seventh month. So we're being given a clue of something prophetically happening at those times. And now we can understand 
that when you do a proper count of the Feast of Weeks and you finish your seven Sabbaths and then you have 50 days to count, we come again to the ninth of Av to the first of Tishri. The fasting of the morning of the fifth and the fasting of the morning of the seventh for something they did for 70 years that they wouldn't have been able to do again. So if it was the 70th year and it's come to an end, guess what? This year, they won't be observing the fasting in the morning of the 5th and the 7th month because they've already done it for 70 years. You see? It gets really, really wild. So what about this second one? You see, because the Jews observe on the third day of Tishri. I thought it was, you know, at the Feast of Trumpets. You know, the first or the second, the day and hour, no one knows, right? Why would they observe it on the third? Is it because it happened on the third? No. This fasting and mourning is called the Fast of Gedalia. It's a minor Jewish holiday. They observe it on the third day of Tishri. Now, they don't observe it on the third day of Tishri because it happened on the third day of Tishri. It actually happened on the Feast of Trumpets. But they observe it on the third of Tishri because the first and second of Tishri are the day and hour no one knows for the Feast of Trumpets. So they're not going to have a fasting in the morning on the third of Tishri. I mean, on the on the Feast of Trumpets, when it's a feast of the Lord with the sounding of the shofars, they're not going to be fasting in mourning, so they observe it over here. But the actual event happened over here. So what do we have? Exactly 50 days between the two attacks. We've got one attack and then the second attack. <coughs> and where's the count? The end of seven Sabbaths and then 50 days. What are we looking at? The end of the seventh Sabbath, pre-trib happens. We're looking for an attack against Israel. It'll last for seven days. And then you have the beginning of the Son of Man, who's here for 40 days. When his 40 days are done as the white horse rider, there's three days. And this being the 50th day on the 29th of Elul is when the Holy Ghost comes in what we call Acts 2.0. This will be a, a greater outpouring than, the, than, than anything recorded in Scripture upon a group of people who are a chosen remnant to remain to work. And then what happens? When they receive that outpouring, they go out from Jerusalem, and then the second attack comes. This second attack is the attack that begins officially World War III. It begins neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom. It all begins at this second attack, which is going to be the beginning of the 14 years. And I'm going to show it to you. We even see it here from the story in Jeremiah. This, this continued that story, right? It was being recounted, Zedekiah. So we see with Zedekiah in the fourth month, 19th day, which started on the 17th day right here. So let me show you this. On the 17th of Tammuz, this is when they were first breached in the walls and so forth. So might we see some sort of attack again from Iran in this time frame right here against Israel? It's possible. It is possible. But is it the event that we're looking for? No. Because now... If something happens in this time frame really big, boy, oh boy, we can set our timers to the pre-trib, brothers and sisters. That would be an absolute clock. That would just set the timer because this will be the time frame. But it's not something that has to happen because prophetically being revealed, we were shown that there's the above and 14 years. We've broken down what this above is and the events that take place right in here from moments before the pre-trib to the events of the pre-trib and the events of the first attack. So I'm not expecting anything happening before 
that would tell the world, oh my goodness, the time of the end is at hand. We better seek the Lord. And, and all of a sudden, a billion people come to Christ. That's not what gonna, uh, what's going to happen because Scripture tells us the whole world would be caught off guard. Okay? Only those watching and praying will be ready. So when we go into seeing with Zedekiah, okay, here uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had already attacked. He had besieged it. And then we follow and we see Jeremiah here connected in, uh, in Jeremiah 39, verse 14. Even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah. So now we have Gedaliah. So what happened? What we know happened is once the, the attack happened on the 9th of Av, that was the destruction of one of the temples, just as we read here, right? Both temples were destroyed at that time. This was one of those times. And what we see is from that period of time of the attack and destruction of the temple, Gedaliah gets set in charge. So Gedaliah becomes, is a governor in Jerusalem. So they're attacked, they're destroyed, prisoners have been taken, and they set Gedaliah up to be governor. And Jeremiah is there with him and so forth. And Gedaliah is the leader over Jerusalem after its destruction for about six weeks. Just go read the history of Gedaliah. He only became governor over Jerusalem for approximately six weeks. Why? Well, what you come to find out is there's Jeremiah, the captain of the guard had Jeremiah with them. They were going to allow people to start coming back, a, a portion of people, to allow them to start to rebuild. And they had Gedaliah in charge. Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We see this right here. Another piece of scripture we've taught on many times over the years in 2 Chronicles 36. There's Zedekiah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Jeremiah, the prophet in verse 13. Uh, and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. This is talking about Zedekiah, who made him swear to God, swear by God. But he stiffened his neck, his neck and hardened his heart and turned not unto the Lord God of Israel. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his word and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of Chaldees, slew his young men with the sword. See, and all these brought to, uh, to, brought he to Babylon, broke down the wall, fires, until what? Until Cyrus shows up. So we have this period of time within all of this where Cyrus, whoever this modern-day Cyrus is going to be, who is going to be coming forward, at that time, but we're not going to go down that Cyrus event. So what we've seen is historically there's an attack. Even in modern times, there were their 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 scattering about. So we have events of the ninth of Av of the was. We have events of the ninth of Av of the ninth of Av in the is. And what are we expecting? From the moment of the pre-trib, we're looking for an attack to happen against Israel on the ninth of Av. And then another one that will trigger the 14 years and nation against nation with the destruction this time of Jerusalem. The first one is going to be a light affliction, though an attack. It's going to be big and significant, but nothing like the second attack at the end of 50 days that will be the destruction of Jerusalem. So now watch what happens. We see here, there they are. We're continuing from Jeremiah 39. We're into 40. We know Gedaliah has now been set on in charge. In verse 6 of Jeremiah 40, it says, Then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of this, dwelt among his people um, that were left in the land. There's Gedaliah again. Gedaliah. And then in verse 8, Then came to Gedaliah, even Ishmael, the son of, of Nethaniah, all of the parents, 
and it says they and their men we keep reading it talked about how um in verse 11 likewise when all the jews were in moab among uh and among the amorites of edom and that were in all the countries heard that the king of babylon had left a remnant in judah and that he had set over them gedalia okay now listen to what happens they've set gedalia okay so this first attack had happened israel's been attacked the leader has been destroyed and they're now going to set gedalia up as governor so i have no idea who this modern day gedalia may play out to be or if it plays out exactly like this the point here is the two attacks so what ends up happening look at this even all the jews returned out of the places whither they were driven and came into the land of judah to gedalia unto mitzvah and what gathered wine and summer fruits gathered wine what do you think they were doing when gathering wine they were gathering wine because it was a celebration at the feast of trumpets they could have only gathered wine for new wine at the time of the year's end at the feast of trumpets so watch this in jeremiah chapter 40 we see the toxi and gathered wine this is the same wine, banqueting wine, intoxication that we read about that the apostles and disciples were being accused of being drunk on. They were accused of being drunk on new wine because it was the time of wine season. So what's important here that it's the time of wine season where it's been brought in and summer fruits and so forth? Well, let's keep reading. In verse in Jeremiah 40, verse 13, moreover, Jonan, the son of Chorus, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to Gedalia to Mitzvah and said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of Amorites, hath sent Ishmael, the son of Nethanah, to slay thee? But Gedalia, the son of Ahakim, believed them not. You see? Let in verse uh, 15 part way through let me i pray thee i and i will slay ishmael and no man shall know it wherefore should he slay thee all the jews which have gathered unto thee should be scattered and the remnant of judah perish but he says don't do this right verse 16 but gedalia said <clears throat> unto jonan um thou shall not do this thing for thou speakest falsely against Ishmael. So here they are gathering in wine to bring to the celebration that they're going to have at the Feast of Trumpets. Now, how do we know this? Because we go to chapter 41, and 41 says, And it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, uh, of the seed of royal <clears throat> and the prince of the king and the ten men came unto Gedalia the son of Mitzvah so they were all there here they all are in the seventh month coming to this banquet where where the wine is gathered and the summer fruits are gathered and it says Ishmael also slew all the Jews okay actually we should go up one more <clears throat> in verse 2 then arose Ishmael and the ten men that were with them and smart Gedalia, the son of Ishmael, with the sword, and slew him whom the king of Babylon had made gover governor over the land. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedalia. You see what happened? They observe the fasting in the morning of the seventh month here, but it happened at the Feast of Trumpets. So when you go back here to see where this first attack had happened and that caused them to, to be in chaos, and you go 50 days later, you got to remember, it's the 9th of Av to the 10th of Av. And then you follow that, and we know it's 50 days later, it's the 29th of Elul to the 1st of Tishri. 
we have a precise 50 days count which is precisely what we need for the 50 days to pentecost and pentecost is right here when new wine is ready and at the fast of gedalia or at the event with gedalia when he gets slew when he when they kill him they had new wine you see how that works <clears throat> it, there's there's no possibility of having wine back in in um in uh, uh what is it uh late april into may or or may into june you don't have new wine then it always came in late summer early fall that's why they were having wine that was gathered in with the summer fruit that's why this is truly pentecost which is precisely 50 days after the eighth of av and we're understanding that there is a 50 days this portion called above and according to Zechariah chapter 7, there's something in relation to the fifth month fasting and mourning and the seventh month fasting and mourning between one attack and a second attack that they observed for 70 years, but they won't get to anymore. Because they will be attacked again on the first one and attacked again on the second one prophetically relating to the end of days. Let me show you what this means in relation to Ishmael. Ishmael, as we see right here, okay? Ishmael is the one that slew him. When we go to the revelation of the 14 years in the book, one of the revelations, in the book of Genesis, we go to the story of Abraham and his first son. His first son that he has is called Ishmael, and it says, the Lord has heard thy affliction. He will be a wild man, okay? Who is Ishmael? Ishmael is the one that brings the attack against Jerusalem, who historically brought it against Gedalia at the Feast of Trumpets. When we look back in, in the was of history, and we see the first Ishmael being the child of Abraham, called thy affliction, and he would be a wild man, how old was Abraham when he was born? Abraham was 86 years old. 86 years old. Now watch what happens. You come to Genesis 17, <clears throat> and you see Abraham is now 99 years old. That's what? 13 years later, right? So if you come down here, you see right here, Abraham was 99 years old when the circumcision happened, and Ishmael was 13 years old. Remember the tribulation? That means Ishmael starts right here, and at the end of 13 years, there it is, 13 years, and there's the picture of Ishmael there. Now, watch what happened. These 13 years, what happens? At the end of 13 years, God makes a covenant with Abraham and his family in the circumcision. What do we know happens here? At the end of 13 years, the Lord's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, confirming the covenant that he had made. In that final 14th year watch what happens with scripture we go to Genesis 21 and we now see that Abraham is a hundred years old when Isaac is born when is Christ coming he returns feet down at the 14th year it started off with Abraham being 86 and 14 years later Isaac showing up after what the circumcision, and the 13 years with Ishmael. So why is this important with this connection with Ishmael? He's right there at the beginning of the 14 years. The beginning of the 14 years starts with Ishmael. And what am I showing you in the prophetic of what was shall be? I'm showing you that Ishmael, who is the one that came and destroyed them at the Feast of Trumpets, is the same typology of the Ishmael type, which is, who was Ishmael, guys? Ishmael was the Arab line. Ishmael is the Arab line, and who's coming to attack and destroy Jerusalem at the Feast of Trumpets to begin the 14 years? The Ishmael type. And it happens after the 50 days. So how much more clarity can we go into this? Well, let me show you what happens even in those 50 days. 
without, again, going too much into all of the details. So we know the first attack happens. So we've got the pre-trib will happen at the end of the seventh Sabbath. Then you're going to have the pre-trib happens and you're going to have an attack in Israel. It's not going to be the attack that destroys Jerusalem, but it's going to be a big, significant attack. And remember, tens of millions of people have just vanished. And then you've got the 50 days starting. This war won't last very long, probably only about seven days. Then we show that the Son of Man is coming to begin his 40 days. He is going to be the Son of Man. The Lord is coming as the Son of Man for 40 days to fulfill what he told us he would fulfill as Jonah. And he's going to do it as the white horse rider. Again, something we've shown a number of times, but let me show you these different places. When you understand the differences in the Gospels and you go to the story of Jonah, you will understand why they're so different because they're prophetic and they haven't happened yet. When Jesus says he will give no sign in Luke 11, but the sign of Jonah, it says as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the son of man be unto this generation. He's talking about this final generation. The Lord has not fulfilled this yet. That's why they're different in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. They're all prophetic to when he comes for 40 days, when he comes at the end of seals, and when he comes at the end of trumpets, or relating to all three of those time frames. So right here, we know if he's going to come to do as Jonah did, which was what? To warn Nineveh. So if it's the same typology, the Son of Man is coming for 40 days to warn people about the judgment that's coming. Which means even though the pre-trib has happened, even though that first attack has happened, he's now coming to warn that this is just the beginning and you had, be be you had better be ready. But he knows his people in, in Jerusalem won't be ready. We see this in Luke chapter 19. Again, another piece of scripture we only see in Luke. And when you know these differences and see something only in one compared to the others, there is prophetic reasoning. It says right here in Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even in this thy day, the things that the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and shall compass thee round about and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Not only did he speak this for them in those days that it was going to be coming. This is also prophetic insight to what he is saying when he's here as the Son of Man for 40 days, precisely as we read in Luke, in his discourse, chapter 21, starting in verse 20, it says, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter hereinto, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. All things which are written. Do you realize living in the is from Christ until now, all things haven't yet been fulfilled, obviously? He's now saying that these days, prophetically, he's warning that when the surrounding begins and then they get destroyed, this is going to be the beginning of vengeance of all things which have been written may be fulfilled. You see what's happening? It's prophecy. It's saying at the destruction of Jerusalem, that is the beginning. That's really where everything from here on in is going to be chaos. Oh, is it going to be chaos at the start of the 50 days, at the pre-trib? Sure. But this, at the destruction of Jerusalem, that second attack, this is the one that kicks off 
the chaos of tribulation. And it says, But woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Listen to this. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Were the times of the Gentiles fulfilled over the last 2,000 years? At the destruction that happened back in about 70 AD? No. This is prophecy. A lot of scholars have tried to say, well, these are the events that already took place back then. No, they're not. Did the Lord return? No. These events haven't happened yet. Until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles isn't fulfilled till the end of seals. It's not till the end of seals. This is a picture right here. This is the Lord warning Jerusalem. Warning them in the land of Judah. In what we would say in the land of Israel to the house of Judah. He is warning them as he said he would as Jonah did. And that's going to begin right here. After the seven-day wedding that takes place in heaven, after the seven-day war, the one week about war approximately, that will take place from the first attack, the Lord is here for 40 days warning, and when he's gone, which would be around September 29th, if this year, then there's not many days, which is three days, to what we call Acts 2.0. That an outpouring upon a group of remnant workers that will be greater than all of history. And when they go out from there, what happens? The attack that he warned about. You see why it was so important way back in 2018 as Zechariah became uh, began to be revealed. And we knew that there was a portion called above connected to something that had to be less than 15 years but was something more than 14. And we had something here relating to us to one attack and a second attack. And the second attack, lo and behold, begins at the Feast of Trumpets. So if the Son of Man is coming at, at a time to warn, as he said, as Jonah did, well, watch what happens. He's coming to warn, as he said Jonah did, and why is it important that it has to start at the Feast of Trumpets? <clears throat> well, it told us it was 14 years. It told us it was 14 years. So if Luke's discourse is, is within that portion of 50 days called above, look what happens in Mark. In Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, listen to what it says. In verse 8, it says, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What is this saying? This is the red horse rider. This is when the great sword is given, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is what Jesus was warning about would come to Jerusalem first. And then you see the 14 years beginning. If you go to Luke's discourse in chapter 21, we see something very different. It says in verse 10, Then said he unto them, Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But listen to what verse 12 says. But before all these. Which means Mark's discourse, the 14 years beginning, which is nation against nation, which is the red horse rider, something is coming and is going to happen first. And this first that it's going to happen is what relates to Luke's discourse. So when you go to Revelation chapter 6, and we go to the red horse rider in verse 4, uh, in verse 3 it opened uh, the second seal, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon, to take peace from the earth. Well, who is peace? The dove, right? The Holy Ghost. When does the Holy Ghost anoint this group of people with an anointing that hasn't been seen ever to this, to this level that's going to happen? Well, what happens? 
The Holy Ghost anoints them and the Holy Ghost leaves. And then what happens? The red horse rider. What happens? Peace is taken from the earth. And then what? And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. This is your nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Which means, Mar which means Luke's discourse is the portion above before the red horse rider of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is, of course, the white horse rider. It is Messiah Christ Jesus who is the white horse rider who is here during the 40 days from the, about the 15th, 16th of Av until about the 26th of Elul late in September. And what do we have before? We have one attack. What do we have after? The attack that destroys Jerusalem. Right off the bat, being able to understand the second attack that begins nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom with the red horse rider, that's not hard to understand now. Because you could see Luke's is talking about something that happens but first, and Mark's is when the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom actually begins, which is red horse rider. So clearly, before this attack that Jesus is warning about for 40 days, that when they see the compassing about that's going to begin during these three days, they had better flee to the mountains because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So this one isn't hard to follow. And who's this one by? It's connected to Ishmael. And Ishmael, we saw, is the beginning of the 13 to the end of 13 years, and then he's 13, and then the circumcision, and then the promise, and Isaac is born, and it's the 14th year later. Just like the revelation of 13 years starts with Ishmael and an attack, 13 years ends, the, uh, uh, the covenant is renewed, and the Lord returns at the 14th year. It's the same storyline in a big picture. So who is the Ishmael? Right? Who is the Ishmael? That's the question that a lot of people want to know. Well, the Ishmael, as we revealed, is going to be Syria. The first attack is going to be Iran. Now, how do these attacks play out, and what's their, what's their connection to them? Well, before we go into that, let me go a little bit further into Jesus saying this but first okay when jesus said in luke's discourse but first that's all in relation to the 40 days that are a part of the 50 they're in the midst of the 50 they're the 40 days of the son of man and now listen to what he says here <clears throat> in luke chapter 17 Starting in verse 24, he talks about being as lightning from one end unto the other when the Son of Man comes in his day. This is Matthew's conversation. He's talking about when he returns feet down, returning as lightning from one end unto the other. This is when he returns feet down at the end of 13 to start that 14th year. Then listen to what he says. The same conversation as Luke's discourse. But first... But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. That same last generation conversation as the 40 days of the Son of Man, as he said with Jonah. And then he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Now, this one in Luke is not the same context as the one in Matthew. In Matthew's gospel, when it's talking about the Lord returning on the day and hour no one knows, and then it being as the days of Noah, he's talking about it being one year and ten days, which is going to be craziness during the final year, the treading of the grapes and him destroying the enemies. And then ten days later is the proclamation of the Jubilee. But there's another typology picture of the story of Jonah, which plays out of the 40 days or which plays out these 50 days. And the big picture 
of the 14 years. And I want to show you what Luke's is all about. Luke's has nothing to do with Matthew's final 14th year of tribulation after the Lord has returned as lightning from one end to the other. This one is talking about when the Son of Man is coming to this generation, the final generation, when he will be here for 40 days, not a single day, feet down, but when he's here for 40 days being rejected. That those 40 days are going to be <clears throat> the 40 days as Noah's. Now, how can we prove this out? Well, we know that Noah had 40 days that came first, but let me prove it to you. If we go into the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we see in Hebrews chapter 11, we have Enoch, who is a picture of the pre-trib bride, right? Enoch was translated, did not see death, because he pleased God, he had faith, and uh, um, and believed that God was a rewarder of them that diligently sought him. And then what? There's your pre-trip. Then you have Noah. And what's the story of Noah here? The 40 days. And then what do we have? Then we have, by faith, Abraham, looking for this place of his inheritance, and he comes to the place, what? That has foundations. This is the Lord. This is a picture of the great multitude coming in the great multitude mid-trib rapture and Abraham with his people looking for a place that has foundations because remember, only the foundations will be built during seals. And then what happens? At the end of tribulation, at the 14th year, just like the story with Abraham, Sarah gives birth to Isaac. So what do you have? You have Enoch as the pre-trib. You have Noah as the 40 days of the Son of Man. You have Abraham going to the place where there's foundations, which is the end of seals, the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion for the great multitude rapture. And then you've got Sarah giving birth to Isaac, which is the time of the return of the Lord. So you see what we're seeing here with Noah? The picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man and those who will be with him that will become heirs of righteousness. That remnant worker group that we're talking about, or that we spoke about, that will be with the Lord during the 40 days, and then they'll receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost after. It's right there in the same story. It's only talking about these 40 days. So as we follow through this, we now come to say, okay, what evidence do we have that we can really point to in all this. Okay, first of all, we've proven the wheat. That winter wheat starts its harvest right here. You count seven Sabbaths, and it ends right here. This literally happens on the earth right now. You then have, when you understand Leviticus and the count of the Feast of Weeks, you then number 50 days. You number 50 days from the ninth of Av, and it brings you to the last day of the year, which is true Pentecost and new wine. We saw the attack by Gedalia, uh, against Gedalia by Ishmael, and Ishmael, who with Abraham in the birth, reflected the beginning of 13 years to the end of 13, and then the 14th year of Isaac being born, the picture of the end of days. And we know this is the time frame of grape harvest. We know also, check this out, we know also in Mark's discourse that not in Luke's, but in Mark's discourse, we have the picture of the Son of Man coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. That's why you see everybody hiding at the end of the sixth year of seals. And then what does it say? It'll be at the day and hour no one knows, which means... Six years from the day and hour no one knows when he came to warn and then not many days they're being compassed about and then the attack comes at the Feast of Trumpets by the modern day Ishmael. Six years later would be what? Six years later would end right here and this would be the beginning of the seventh year and guess what? It's the day and hour no one knows when the Lord's return. When he's returning for the great multitude rapture in the clouds on heavenly Mount Zion. 
Hello. And then what happens? Then you go to Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, this is now after all the events of trumpets. Here's the Lord returning immediately after the tribulation of those days when he's coming as lightning from one end unto the other, which would be what? After the 13 years, like the Ishmael story, then at the 14th year, Abraham's 100, and that's the 14th year, and Isaac is born. It's the picture of the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what does it say? The day and hour no one knows, and that day and hour no one knows will be as it was in the days of Noah. And what do you get? 13 years. So you got your six of seals. And then the Lord's coming in the clouds on heavenly Mount Zion on the day and hour no one knows. Then you've got six years of trumpets, which is the end of 13. The picture of Ishmael from 13, 1 to 13. And then Isaac is born. And scripture tells us that it'll be also on the day and hour no one knows. Which means the end of 13 years would be the 29th of Elul. And the start of the 14th year will be at the Feast of Trumpets. The day and hour that no one knows when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives to start that 14th year. And what happens? He'll be seen as lightning from one end to the other. Zechariah 14, the mountain splits. He's going to destroy all the enemies, bind Satan, do all these things. And it will be the year of Noah and 10 days. And on the 10th day, as we said earlier, that's the blowing of the shofar. When does the blowing of the shofar take place? It says it happens 10 days later in Leviticus 25, 10 days later on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So if the end of 13 and the end of 14 is Feast of Trumpets and then 10 days later Atonement, and the end of six years of seals is Feast of Trumpets, we can trace it back to the 14 years beginning at the Feast of Trumpets because it's connected to Ishmael and Ishmael starts the 13 and ends the 13 and prophetically we had the fifth and the seventh month the fifth and the seventh month for over six years that has been wrapped in this mystery of trying to understand how on earth does the fifth and the seventh month relate if it's also supposed to be connected to the Feast of Trumpet, I mean, to the Feast of Weeks, when the world tells us this is the Feast of Weeks. It was impossible until you understood the actual harvests of the earth and how they work and that there are two weed harvests. When we did, everything exploded. And so what did we understand? First attack is going to be a light attack. They're not all going to flee to the mountains here at the, at the attack on the 9th of Av. We saw that historically in the was, we saw that what happened was they would, um, uh, um, there's still going to be people there, right? So they put Gedalia in charge. They, they have some people come back. When the, when the people that did flee, not everybody fled, but when people did flee, they all started coming back because Gedalia was put in charge. And they thought this was wonderful, so they start coming back. But we know that this war, this first attack, isn't going to break out into a huge Middle East war. Not overly huge anyways, <coughs> because it's not the actual beginning of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Because the Son of Man has to return on the eighth day as the white horse rider to be here for 40 days. And while he's here, he's warning... Before he leaves at the end of 40 days, he's warning that an attack is coming where they will be compassing Jerusalem. And now they had better flee because now Jerusalem itself is going to be literally destroyed. That's what's coming, guys. There are two attacks. And just like in history, one was Babylon. The other one was Ishmael. Who is this modern-day Babylon and Ishmael? Well, let's go to the favorite piece of mine that 
put the whole thing together. That confirmed the entirety of this storyline. And it comes from Isaiah 9.1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. See that? When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterward did more grievously affect her by way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. So we see there's a light affliction attack that's going to come on two northern cities first. Remember, the ninth of Av historically is a tax against Israel. It doesn't mean it always has to be or a tax against the Jewish people. It doesn't mean it always has to be Jerusalem being attacked and destroyed. But it's an attack against them. And this is going to be a serious attack. And we see here in another prophetic piece that it's going to be two cities in Israel. I've been speaking for years that it would be Haifa and Tel Aviv. Haifa and Tel Aviv are going to be attacked, maybe not completely destroyed, but absolute devastation. And it's going to happen right after the pre-trib escape, in regardless of what year it happens. And this will begin a war against some of the nations there in the Middle East. But the nations are going to want to settle it down after millions of people have vanished, after this chaos takes place. They're not going to want it to break out into full-on war and nuclear war and everything else. So it's going to settle. And what happens? The Son of Man comes, and now he will be at least in Jerusalem, maybe in other places, but he will for sure be the white horse rider there in Jerusalem, warning them, as he said he would, as Jonah did, about a compassing about that's going to happen, meaning the compassing about by Ishmael isn't going to happen while the Lord's there. It's going to happen after the Lord is gone. And we've shown this even in the story of Noah, how the raven goes out before the dove. The raven is the Antichrist spirit. The word raven in Hebrew means dove. I mean, uh, um, means Arab. It comes from the word Arab, from the darker complexion of their skin. And then you got three on the third day, you've got the dove, which is the Holy Ghost. And during this time is when the compassing about takes place. The anointing of the Holy Ghost happens. This remnant group will go out from Jerusalem and then spread throughout the earth. And then, bam, Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed at the Feast of Trumpets. You see, when Christ came the first time, remember this. When Christ came the first time, he said in Matthew 15, I come not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do you know that the house of Israel, the kings in, in ancient Israel, they began the count of their kings in the month of Nisan. Jesus came <laughs> for the house of Israel. Israel the first time and what did he fulfill the spring feasts the house of Judah this is all the accession and non-accession revelation the house of Judah begins its count of their kings from the month of Tishri the seventh Hebrew month on the first of the month at the feast of trumpets is when they begin their year count for their kings and as I said in the past, who is in Jerusalem, right? Who is in Israel right now? Is it the house of Israel? No, they're scattered throughout the earth mixed with Gentiles. So who is in Israel right now? The house of Judah. And lo and behold, how does the tribute, when does the tribulation begin? At the fall feasts. What's going to be, what's going to be fulfilled in the end of days? The fall feasts. Because now it'll deal with the house of Judah. Yes, there's, there's still the church and the world and the house of Israel, that, that whole Gentile portion that goes to the end of seals. Then it turns back to Judah and it goes to the end of trumpets. And it's going to be these things that are going to be fulfilled during the tribulation, during the very end of days. So, of course, it's going to begin at trumpets 
and not at Nisan because we're now talking about the house of Judah. So everything in this directly connects and reveals everything we've been told and shown in Scripture. So what about that light affliction? Well, it's going to happen right here. This time frame right here, depending where you are in the world, right after the pre-trib escape, which means we're not going to see it. There's going to be an attack in northern Jerusalem in two cities, and those two cities of Zebulun and of Talim, which are typologies, I believe are going to be Haifa and Tel Aviv. And the world is going to be in a panic because war will break out in the Middle East. But we know it won't last very long. Because then what happens? The people walked in darkness, saw a great light. Hello. Are you tracking this? So what's going to happen? There's the light affliction, the, the chaos that breaks out until the Lord comes. He starts his 40 days. He's the one coming to shine his light in the darkness after the light affliction. We know he's here for 40 days, and when the 40 days are done, there's the compassing about that he was warning about, and then the beginning of everything, of all the vengeance of the Lord, exactly as he said would happen to begin the 14 years. And it's going to be by this Ishmael, modern-day Ishmael character. And... Um, what was I going to say? Oh, in relation to the Son of Man, we know he's the great light. He's the one coming to shine his light in the darkness. We know it's Christ, the white horse rider. And now as you understand some of these differences in the Gospels, and you go Luke, Mark, Matthew, you see why Mark starts the way it does, and Luke says, but before all these things. You see? This is still part of the above. He's coming to shine his light in the darkness. When we found this, we found out that Jesus fulfilled this from the was into the is in Luke uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 12. And it said, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed unto Galilee, uh, went by the borders of Zebulun and of Talim, Verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and Naphtalim, and the land of, uh, sorry, of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee, of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. You see, this is him coming after the first attack. So remember what I said with Ecclesiastes 1.9. What was, what is, both of them shall be. So you had it there in Isaiah. Jesus fulfilled it in one type in the is, and it's still revealed for us for the is to come. Now listen to what it says. Look at how it began. Now when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison. Why was this important? And I'm going to go off on a little piece here because I want you guys to understand this. Jesus was born in the third month, that 15th to the 16th day, which is the month of Sivan and is currently the month of Taurus. Now, this is where he was born. When you go into John, uh, Luke chapter 3, watch what happens. In Luke chapter 3, we see about Jesus being baptized. Jesus gets baptized. The Holy Ghost descends on him. Of course, he's being baptized by John the Baptist. And it says Jesus began to be about 30 years old, which means at the time of Jesus' baptism, it was his birthday. What did Matthew chapter 4 say? When Jesus fulfilled this in the is of Isaiah chapter 9, listen to what it says. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison. When was John cast into prison? Well, remember, after Jesus' baptism, there was at least a month and a half because he went into the wilderness for 40 days. And after he went into the wilderness for 40 days, he chose his disciples. 
And after he had his disciples and he was roaming around with his disciples, then he's what? He's baptizing, right? There's John. Uh, Jesus is baptizing his disciples and they're baptizing others. And John was baptizing in another place. For John was not yet cast into prison. Do you know why that's important? Because Jesus was baptized at the time of his birth. John was not cast into prison for about two months after he had baptized Jesus at his, about his birthday. This is something we've shared on in the past as well. People will say anywhere from six months to 18 months. It was about 10 months from when, from when um, Jesus was baptized until John was cast into prison. So why Matthew chapter 4 is so wildly important and completed the revelation of the timing is because when Jesus fulfilled this in the is, and we understood that he didn't fulfill it at his birthday, but he fulfilled it approximately two months after his birthday, that means if we go back here and we believe in the world tells us that this is the Feast of Weeks, and then we say, okay, well, then from here, we should count 50 more days. It would appear that, hey, from Jesus' birthday, there's the start of 40 days. But now we know from the revelation of Jesus fulfilling it that he didn't fulfill Matthew 4 or Isaiah 9 at the baptism. He fulfilled it two months later after John had been cast in, at the time when John had been cast into prison. This is a huge deal because when you come back into Isaiah 9 and it talks about coming and shining his light in the darkness, it tells us, for unto us a child is born. It makes you think that it's connected to his birth. But the confirmation of his fulfillment of it tells us that it was two months later. And lo and behold, we reveal this is the true feast of weeks. This is the beginning of the 50 days, which is exactly 50 days from the fifth month to the seventh month, both fasting and mourning. And the Lord's coming back after the seven day wedding in heaven on the eighth day here for 40 days to fulfill 40 days as the white horse rider, son of man. And it's prophetically exactly lined up to the time John was cast into prison, which was two months after Jesus's birth. And it's exactly prophetically revealed in Isaiah 9, 1, that there is a light attack that comes first, the 40 days of the Son of Man, not at his birthday, but two months later. And once he's gone, when the 40 days are done and he's been warning them, as he said he would do with Jonah, look what happens. Isaiah 9, 12. You want to know who the Ishmael is of the end of days? Well, here it is. Isaiah 9, verse 12. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He's bringing destruction against them. Jerusalem is going to be attacked. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be because of their error. It's going to be for their blindness. It's going to be for their stiff neckness. And remember what scripture says. It all begins at the house of the Lord. You see, he's going to bring destruction to Jerusalem, then come to the whole world, reconcile in seals all of the world for all of those that will come to him for the great multitude rapture, and then return to his focus on the house of Judah till the end of trumpets. The second attack is going to come at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, as the Ishmael type, and it is going to be by Syria. Syria. It is going to be Syria, who we are told in Daniel is the lion. It is the lion who comes first. The lion is Assad. Bashar al-Assad's name used to be, the, the last name 
used to mean beast. And then his father or his grandfather, when they got into politics, changed it from beast into the word lion, meaning Asa, Al Assad, meaning the lion. It used to be, I can't remember what it was, but it meant the beast. So the first beast who is a lion. It's the lion who's coming. It is Syria who is going to come and destroy them at the Feast of Trumpets in the year that it begins, which I believe is 2024. So you see, we have scripture everywhere confirming to us there is one attack that comes first. It will be a light affliction after the pre-trib. It'll be a short-lived war in the Middle East because people don't want it to flare up. Then the Son of Man will return about two months after his birthday, equivalent to the time after his baptism when John was finally cast into prison and look exactly where it lands. At the revelation of the 50 days and the start, within those 50 days where the 40 days of the son of man should begin and when those seven days are over of the of the wedding feast in heaven of the attacks in the middle east the lord begins he's warning them and probably the world of everything that's coming and jerusalem being compassed about he leaves the the raven spirit goes out and that raven spirit will enter into assad and they will come and compass about well, it looks like everything's being settled. Syria is not going to stand for it. They're going to move in the chaos that's starting to break out around the world with millions of people having vanished, with Israel already having been attacked by Iran in the north. Now Syria is going to move in, and on the day and hour no one knows, the Feast of Trumpets, the 14 years will begin at the Red Horse Rider when the great sword is given, when they shall begin to kill each other, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Brothers and sisters, that was a little bit longer. I went into some more weeds than I maybe wanted to, but I hope you guys can see it. I hope you can share this with others. I, I tried to make it clear in the sense that, yes, everything I've just showed you, I absolutely believe it is absolutely unequivocally revealed and understood. The only thing is, is it really going to be the year 2024? I do believe it will be to the absolute best of my understanding. The rest of everything, it, it, it's there. It's revealed. It's understood. And it's another reason why I believe 2024 is going to be the year, let alone the count from 2017, September 11, let alone from the ministry, let alone how everything has become more and more clear in these last few months and in the last year. The point of all of this is to be able to see and to understand this is going to be the beginning of everything from the 8th to the 9th of Av, no matter what year it begins, though I believe absolutely 2024. So with that, guys, share it, study it, break it down, understand this is Iran attacking in a Middle East war, breaking out for a short period of time. And this is going to be the attack by Bashar al-Assad, the beast that is a lion. He is the modern-day Ishmael who will attack and bring about destruction at the Feast of Trumpets and begin the 14 years of tribulation after the pre-trib escape and the above comes to an end, which was precisely now understood and revealed from the fifth and seventh month of those things which they did for 70 years brothers and sisters i pray it blesses you i pray you watch it and re-watch it understand it grasp it and share a lot of these points with anybody you can with anybody that's interested and maybe we can reach uh some people over in israel as well let them be prepared maybe jews that maybe don't want to listen now but will listen maybe once this all begins so with that, God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.